Is this live or Memorex? All right, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is May 1st, 2023. And rabbit, rabbit. Pardon? Hmm? Rabbit, rabbit. Is it, is it a rabbit day? No, you're always supposed to say that on the first of the month for good luck. Uh, my family does that too, but really? I found that very few other people do it. So it's <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said that around. Rabbit, funny. rabbit. I did too. But ask me the first thing you say upon um, waking. Okay. If you, if you say like, hello to someone, you're no. screwed. Uh, you got to wait till next month. Up. Good to know. Anyway, I'll file that away in a calendar rabbit reminder rabbit. for next year. I think you year. should follow the white rabbit, though. That's important. That's the one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we are here for Human Design Catalyst. Uh, my name is Jonah Dempsey, and I am joined by Michael steenbeck Litvin and Mark Germain. Thank you, Mark. A and Mike. Mike hosts here in Santa Fe, New Mexico at Fasciation Space, and so thank you so much for hosting. Um, the topic today is profile, and we're going to be talking about the lines. I'm going to kind of give an overview, and then we're going to do a human design satsang Q&A with Mike and Mark. So we're going to kind of open it up. You can ask questions about your profile. You can ask any question, really, um, anything that you want to know more about. But to start with, um, I am just going to give a little bit of an overview of what profile is. And then I'm going to talk about the six lines and kind of characterize them just a little bit. So profile refers to the line of your personality, Sun, Earth, and your design, Sun, Earth. There are 12 profiles, the 1, 3, 1, 4, 2, 4, 2, 5, and so on, all the way up to the 6, 3, at which point it loops back around to the 1, 3. And so the reason we have two numbers here, of course, is because there's an 88 degree difference between your personality sun earth and your design sun earth. That 88 degree difference means it's impossible to have a 1 1 profile. It's impossible to have a 2 2 profile because the first number refers to your personality sun earth, the second number to your design sun earth. The personality sun earth is calculated at the moment of birth, the design sun earth is calculated roughly 88 days before birth, when the design crystal is imprinted. It's 88 degrees exactly of the sun, of where the sun was before you were born. So for instance, I was born um, with my personality sun at two degrees Libra. So I have to go 88 degrees back, which is four degrees Cancer. That is where my design sun is. Uh, you can, you know, if you're an astrologer and you kind of, uh, you know, look at the degrees of the signs, you'll understand. And something else you might notice if you're an astrologer is that 88 degrees is one Mercury cycle, roughly, roughly. Not exactly. A Mercury cycle is something like 87.78 days or, or somewhere in there. But in any case, we have these two calculations. Now, what would happen if it was a 90 degree calculation? Well, then the profiles would be 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, and 6, 6. There would only be six profiles. Now, for those who don't understand how the lines are calculated, the lines are equidistant divisions of the ecliptic, the celestial equator. So the signs in astrology are 12 equidistant divisions of the ecliptic, of the celestial equator. Um, the decans, or, or you know, as they're called, are 36 equidistant divisions from 0 to 10 degrees, 10 to 20, and then 20 to 29 of each, of each sign. Um, the degrees in astrology are 360 equidistant divisions of the ecliptic. So when you think about the, the ecliptic, what the ecliptic is, which is the celestial equator, it's taking Earth's equator and projecting it out into space. We're already quite accustomed to these divisions. If you come from astrology background, the 12 signs are 12 equidistant divisions. The 360 degrees are 360 equidistant divisions. Well, the lines make up 384 equidistant divisions of the ecliptic. That's right, there are 384 lines. Because there are 64 hexagrams, or gates as we call them in human design, each gate has six lines. And so this is why if you take a 90 degree angle, what's called a square in astrology, you always have the same line, one and one, two and two, three and three, four and four. But when you take an 88 degree, you're actually off by a couple lines, usually. 
And it's not exactly, because there's 360 degrees, there's 384 lines. And this is why we have the 1, 3 profile, and then we have the 1, 4. We have the 2, 4, and then the 2, 5, the 3, 5, and the 3, 6, and so on. It's because the 88 degree offset makes this sort of movement where first the design side moves, the personality line stays the same, line one. As time passes, the design side moves from the third to the fourth line. These are the first two profiles, one three and one four. We have a one three here in the back. Any other one threes? Okay, and I don't think there's any one fours here. Oh, you're a one four. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wow. wonderful. Okay, so we have one three and one four. That's right, that's right. So, so from the one three to the one four, what you'll notice is right when the sun moves into the first line, if you calculate 88 degrees retrograde of the sun's motion, it was in the third line. It remains in the third line for 21 hours, roughly. Then it moves into the fourth line. While the, while the sun is still in the first line, for the last two hours of the first line, 88 degrees retrograde is now the fourth line. So it's 21 hours of 1-3, one, one, only two hours, roughly, of the 1-4. Mm. There's a two-hour window, so you need a pretty precise birth time. If your birth time is give or take an hour or two, you can't really know if you're one of these transitional profiles because it's a very precise window. Then it moves into the, then from the one four, the sun moves into the second line. The sun moving into a line is just like the sun moving into a degree or the sun moving into a new sign. I mean, this is, if you have an astrological background, you can really visualize it, you can see it because it really is just the first number that we say in the profile is where the sun was when you were born. You are one four, the sun was in the first line when you were born. Look 88 degrees previous to the time you were born, the sun was in the fourth line. And for you as a one three, the sun was in the first line, 88 degrees before you were born, it was in the third line. So that's all the profile numbers mean. They're telling you what line the sun was in when you were born and what line the sun was in 88 degrees retrograde of, of when you were born which is roughly 88 days. Because there are 360 degrees, there's 365 um, and a quarter days. So, you know, there's an extra, a little bit of wiggle room there, so it doesn't always add up perfectly, but... Okay, and then you move on through the profiles. So to really understand what profile is, you have to understand the six lines. The sun moves from one line to the next, to the next, to the next, staying roughly 23 hours in each line. So the sun will be 23 hours roughly in the first line, then 23 hours in the second line, then 23 hours in the third line, and the fourth line, fifth line, sixth line. Then it goes back to the first line. Well, why does it go back to the first line? I mean, we could just number all these lines 1 through 384, mm -hmm. right? Well, it goes back to the first line because it's the first line of a new hexagram. Mm -hmm. The sun spends about 5.7 or 5.9 days, somewhere in there, in each hexagram. And that's, so basically the sun is moving through these hexagrams, these gates, as we call them, and it's spending, you know, a little more than five days in each one. And within each gate, it's moving through six lines, and it always starts on the first line. So when it moves into a new hexagram, you have a first line day. It's, you know, 23 hours of being in the first line of the new hexagram. Then it moves, so, you know, um, you can actually see the story if you study the lines of the I Ching, uh, you can see, for instance, uh, let's take gate 16. Anyone know what gate 16 is about? Skills and enthusiasm. Skills and enthusiasm, yeah. And so gate 16 is a logical gate in the throat, um, and it is Gemini, I believe. And it is, I mean, for the, for the astrologers, you might want to double check that. Mm. I have nine third lines in my chart, so. But in any case, uh, what it's all about is getting better at skills through logic, which requires practice, rehearsal, and basically it's purely theoretical. Logic is not experiential, it's about repetitive practice. So it's like the piano player who has never played a concert, but they've practiced for four hours a day for eight years. And they just practice getting better and better and better and better. Well, the first line of Gate 16 is all about what are skills about, the foundation of skills. 
By the time you get to the sixth line, and you'll see that it tells a story. The second line is the natural trying it out, and, or the third line is the trial and error of experimentation, and so on. Fourth line externalizes, fifth line universalizes. By the time you get to the sixth line, it's kind of been there, done that, and it's looking to the next gate. It's kind of done with rehearsal. Well, what's the next gate? Gate 35, all about experience. It says, I've been in the studio for years. I want to go on tour. I want to go out and practice. I want to play at dive bars. I want to see what the world is actually like experientially. So then the first line of gate 35, you know, it moves into the first line. Well, what is experience all about? Let's get to the bottom of it. What is, what is experience for? And let's learn about experience. Let's get a foundation of what it means to be an experiential person and so on. Well, second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line. By the time it gets to the sixth line, it's kind of done with it. And what's it looking forward to? Gate 45, the gate of money. And it says, you know, not all experiences are created equally. If you have money, you can have a lot better experiences than if you don't have any money, right? So by the time it gets to the sixth line, it's not just content to stay in its gate anymore. It already has one foot into the next gate. And the sixth line is even bigger than that. The sixth line is, is looking out at the whole circuitry that it's a part of, and it's really understanding the entire circuit group that it's a part of. So in any case, you can see how the story of the lines moving, you know, we have 64 gates in the wheel, and in one year, which is one rotation of the Earth around the sun, the sun moves from our perspective through each of these 64 gates, and within each, it moves through six lines, one, two, three, four, five, six, then to the first line of the next gate, up to six, then the first line of the next. So the sun just kind of clicks, click, 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 every 23 hours, roughly, moving into the next line. And when you look at your profile, that's referring to the line that the sun was in when you were born, and the line that the sun was in 88 degrees before you were born. Okay, so that's what it technically is. Now, how do we interpret it? I'm just going, I'm not going to tell all the profiles because there are 12, but you can kind of combine them in different ways that you might understand. What I'm going to use is the house simile, which is something that Ra introduced where he, he basically explained the lines as a house because the hexagram looks kind of like a house where the first line is at the bottom and the sixth line is at the top. And so if you know what a hexagram in the I Ching looks like, it has six chops or six lines, and uh, the lines are just either yan or yin. They're either unbroken or broken lines. Um, and basically, the first line is the foundational line. So if you have a first line in your profile, which is the one three, the one four, I'm a five one. It's also the four one. I don't think there are any four ones here, but um, yeah, you're a five one as well. Yeah, great. So. So anyone that has a first line in their profile may recognize um, some of what I describe here. The 1-3 and the 1-4 may recognize it more because the personality line is what we think we are and what we identify with. The design line is also what we are, but is actually more what the form is doing, which is often unconscious to us. We, we, may, not, we, we may overlook it or not describe ourselves that way. But in any case, regardless of what side the line is in, um, the first line is all about foundations. And it's about essentially getting, it's just like the foundation of a house. The first line is fundamentally insecure, which is funny because you might say, well, shouldn't a house be built in a secure way? Well, yes, but it gets more secure over time. It starts fundamentally insecure. After 20 years, it might be secure in something. It has to become an authority. It has to become an expert and it has to essentially um, learn how to be secure in something. So the first line does not start naturally talented at something. It doesn't start just immediately knowing how to do it. In fact, if first lines don't have a strong foundation in something and they try to do it, well, they, I mean, first of all, they, they usually won't. The first line knows its place and it knows a very fundamental law of the Maya, which is that when the strong and the strong are together and the weak and the weak are together, the species perishes. So the only way to survive is when the strong and the weak bond. So the first line wants to align itself in areas where it's weak with someone who is strong. Likewise, it will allow those who are weak to align it with itself in areas it is strong. This is apprenticeship. 
this is the master of the apprentice in some sense, although of course that has its own... Uh, we have to be careful with some of the keynotes in human design because the, the word master is a keynote of the fourth color, not mine. Um, but typically what people think of when they hear master and apprentice is kind of like the tradition of apprenticeship, where there's like the old master painters who have the... the and then people go under their tutelage, and after 20 or 30 years, they become the master themselves. This is the first line way. And so the first line is really fundamentally here to move slowly from weakness to strength. And they tend to be very introspective and know exactly where they're strong and weak, and know where they stand, and they know where they can improve, and they have a, a, a good sense of Oh yeah, I'm definitely better, like I have a glass blower friend who's a 1-3. He knows he's better, you know, objectively speaking even, not just his opinion, at certain glass blowing tasks than some other glass blowers. And he will assess them and he can know, okay, I'm the authority here, this person should not be telling me how to do this because they are not as good as me at this. But in other areas, he knows that he has a long way to go, or he might never be as good as someone else because he's very introspective about exactly where he is in that process. So it's kind of, it's an introspective line that's here to assess the foundation. Now when you get to the second line, these form a binary. And the second line is likened to the, the first floor of the house. And the joke is, the second line's not introspective, so it's like they're dancing naked with the lights on and the blinds open, and they don't realize it. Who, who has a second line here? What second line? My son has a second line. Any other second lines? Oh yeah, 6-2. Here we are. So we only have one second line here. Interesting. So the second line is the natural, and the natural isn't going to put 10,000 hours into building a foundation. They have a different process. Their process is that they have natural talents which will continue to be revealed, uncovered, discovered throughout their life, but they don't have the introspection of the first line. So you might have a 2 4 or a 2 5 or a 6 2, a 5 2 or a 6 2, and they might tell you, you know, I'm a great cook, but I'm a terrible driver. And they might be a great driver and a terrible cook. You don't really know because they don't have the introspection to compare themselves to others the way that the first line does. And instead what they have is other people always coming at them and telling them what they should do. They get more shoulds than anyone else. I mean, oh they get just shoulded mm -hmm. uh, because they have a, a projection field. But they're, they're essentially, the second and fifth lines have two different kinds of projection fields. The second line is basically projecting their attempt to do something, and they're just doing it. They're doing it as naturals, just to see if they can, without having studied it, without having learned, without having anything. They're just, oh yeah, I can play the piano. How do you know? Uh, well, I just sit down and I play it. It goes out like this. You know, if you've ever met artists who are a bit precious about taking lessons because they don't want to lose that magic spark, it's usually the second line. You know, like I, I don't want to play piano like all these people who studied, who learned, who got their foundation in it. I just do it naturally. I just sit down and it comes out. So, you know, the first line can be kind of jealous of the second line. When you see like the Mozarts of the world who just sit down and write a concerto having no idea how they did it. They didn't study it. They didn't practice it. They didn't learn anywhere. It, they're just naturals. How do they do it? At the same time, they don't necessarily know and they, they can go through to be quite old age having undiscovered talents because the way they discover the talent is when people tell them enough and when the right person gets through to them, you should do this. Because the second line is a very narrow channel that's not prepared to just do any and everything people tell them to do. In fact, they actually say, no, leave me alone most of the time. We call them the hermit. The first line is the investigator. So they're learning you know, deeply about the foundation. The second line is the hermit saying, leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. I don't want to do this. I don't want to help you. But every now and then, somebody gets through and says, you should do this, and, uh, and it works. Um, we have a friend, Von Paul, who some of you know. He's a 2-4. And he was a plumber for 30 years and then retired. And his daughter told him he should work as a greeter at Walmart. Didn't, didn't do it. No, leave me alone. 
Other people told him all sorts of things he should do. Leave me alone. Finally, his granddaughter, eight years old, said, because he was drawing one day on uh, plastic plates, she said, you should just make those drawings, Grandpa, and sell them. Well, he did, and he's done over 10,000 mandalas now because her should got through, hmm. right? And he didn't know he was a good artist. He didn't know he had that talent until he was in his 60s. He discovered his talent. He still doesn't really know other than the fact that people tell him that it's good. So that the second line kind of has to trust, well, I guess people like this. I guess, you know, I guess I'm good at it. I didn't realize. So some shoulds are the call. Right, exactly. Yeah, we, we but, call it the call. But they have a... They have a... A wall. A yeah. wall to the shoulds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because, Fascinating. And it lets in very few. Especially, especially yeah. the two fours I've, mm -hmm. I've heard. Yeah, I mean, well, but try getting across to a 5-2 or a 2-5, it's almost impossible. Right. At least the 2-4 can, the 5-2 and the 2-5, mm -hmm. because they don't have a fourth line that's not, they're not open to the, to others, mm -hmm. they really, um, and you know, a 1-4, a um, sorry, a two, yeah, 2-5, two what's the other one? 6-2. So the 6-2 is interesting also because only the 2-4 has an opening to other people, really. Interesting. Because they have a fourth line, which when we get to the fourth line, we'll mm -hmm. see. The, yeah, you'll start to see the, com the com you know, combinations of these, how different a 1-3 is from a 1-4, how different a 2-4 from a 2-5, and so on, if you have some commonalities. So the second line is the natural. They're kind of the, the ground floor, and they don't necessarily realize um, people can see them, and so on, because they're not introspective in that sense. Mm. The third line is now here to take what the first and the second lines have done. Say you have... A first line who's studied something for 20 years and become an expert on it. Then you have a second line who's just a natural and they're considered just a brilliant genius and they're just heralded as, wow, this person has so much genius. And it's like, well, they didn't study, but they're just a natural. They're just very gifted, what we would call gifted. And you take this first line who studied it and learned every last thing and you take the second line who's just gifted. Well, they both say they have the solution to the problem. They're both in the city planning committee and they say, the first line says, we've done all the studies and I'm an expert, I'm an authority, and if we don't build this bridge, it's going to be better for the city. The second line says, well, look, I've designed bridges all over the world. People love my bridges. And, you know, since I was a little kid, I designed my first bridge when I was three years old, you know, and we should build it. How do we know whether to build it? Well, the third line comes along and they're here to see for themselves what it's like. The third line is the staircase up to the second floor, so to speak. And the third line doesn't trust anyone. It doesn't trust mm. the first line's word, it doesn't trust the second line's word. It's going to see for itself. It's going to figure out through trial and error what works and what doesn't. You know, you, they're going to say, hey, have you ever tried this before? And you're like, yeah, I tried it. Don't do it. It doesn't work. And they're like, interesting. <laughs> Two weeks later, yeah, I tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, they're not, it doesn't matter how many times you tell them it works or it doesn't work. They're going to see for themselves. They're going to test it out. They're going to find out for themselves what works and what doesn't. And so this is the trial and error line. And it's really a line of um, testing and experimenting. You find it in a lot of business people, a lot of scientists. Uh, how many third lines do we have here? Okay, Mark, Jermaine, three, five, three, five, three, five, and a one, three, yeah. So, so yeah, the third line is really here to find out through trial and error what works and what doesn't. It's very mutative, you know, they can discover something by accident, by just, they can, it's called the martyr, because they can often mm -hmm. martyr themselves. And it's like the doctor who tests out the new drug on themselves first. You know, I'll try it on myself, but I wouldn't want anyone else to try it. I'll, I'll do it on myself first to make sure it's safe. And so they end up martyring. Um, they have to vet it. Yeah, because yeah. and we get into the Ajna binary here too with the three and the four. Mm -hmm. The one and the two are both so confident they can that they can cons uh, succeed in their own ways, even though they go about it different ways or whatever. But it's enough that it works. And the three and the four are kind of just as the Ajna does, um, instantiates what works in the Maya in a new way. And for the three, it's about finding it. Well, first of all, exposing what doesn't work, finding out what does. And then discovery process. Discovery process, yeah. Yeah. But the mortar, the mortar, not that they only would take the injection themselves. The mortar is just somebody who will stand up for what they've discovered to be right or wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they'll, they will, because um, the not self three, 
is the the not self martyr as a victim. So the, the threes can feel, you know, because everything has a this and a that. And so the martyr is really standing up for what they believe in, what they've discovered, what they see is true. You yeah, know, so kind, of that, like, uh, kind of like Jerry Maguire quitting or something. It's like, I'm not going to take it. Or, or like the guy in uh, the news, what's the news movie where he shouts, if you, you know, for anyone out there, just open your window and shout, I'm not going to take it anymore. Mm, and all these network. people start. Yeah, network. Exactly, mm. network. Thank you. That's a very martyr kind of thing. And it's really, um, at a different level, it's the anarchist. And it's about mm-hmm. tearing down what doesn't work and uh, just not putting up with a faulty foundation. The first line built it and says, I'm an expert. I'm an authority. The second line says, I'm a natural, I, you know, this is my genius, look at the genius of my creation. The third line says, well, I tested it, it didn't work for me, so we're getting rid of it. I don't mm-hmm. care how genius you are, I don't care how much of an authority you are, it didn't work in this and this and this way that you guys never tested. Mm-hmm. The third line will test things and find what doesn't work in a way that nobody's ever done before. They didn't think to try it that way. They didn't think to test it that way. And third then line, once that happens... Yeah. Fourth line. Well, oh, yeah. I just, really yeah. quick, um, I forgot what I was just going to say. Uh, the the first three lines, um, when you're talking about... Um, Lower trigram? Yeah, but it, there's a... Um, oh, you said a line and then I just got uh, well, they're, they're gonna segued mentally. They're, they're going to tear it down if it doesn't No, not work. just a, yeah. all of them. Uh, but, uh, oh, it will come back to me, people. Yeah. All right. Or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, Right, and we're going to open it up to questions pretty soon. So once I give the overview, we can people can talk about their profiles or what is the third line like? How's it different? Oh, from this that? now I remember. Thing, yeah. you give it time, don't try. It pops in your head as the right line. Um, these things uh, of these lines, everyone has a particular niche or direction or focus or breadth of work. So you're not a natural at everything if you're a second line necessarily you're not a there's things that you're going to be good at and there's other things you're not you're not like just a natural at everything mm-hmm. uh, first line has a particular f- thing that they're going to get that other first lines won't you know like other second lines will be naturals with something and, and and other ones will be something else so everything is uniquely tied to that specific person so you know they're the first line is always uh, an authority, but about what? Hmm. Right, like we were talking about the yeah. gates earlier, the person whose personality sign is the first line of gate 16 is a kind of logical authority compared yeah. to 35 is an experiential authority or 45 is a tribal authority. Yeah, and, and also you can add the context of the Godhead or the quarter, I should say, what quarter it comes in. That gives a thematic to it also. It's very important sometimes. Right, because there are 64 first lines, in, right? Because there's 64 hexagrams. Each one has a first line. There's 64 second lines. There's 64 third lines. And so when you're learning the 64 gates, it can seem like, wow, how am I going to learn these six variations of each gate? But then if you just start with the lines, you realize, okay, there's six lines. With 64 variations. Of each line. That's it's putting it the other way around. Yeah. And the other thing, just to note, uh, the one, two, and the three are lower mm-hmm. trigram, like we said, so it's more self-absorbed, yeah. whereas the uh, four, five, and six is transpersonal. Right, and that's kind of symbolized in the house metaphor. So if the, the third line is the spiral staircase, I don't know why it's a spiral, but DNA, I don't well, know. Well, because it's bumping into shit. You ever walk yeah. on a spiral mm-hmm. staircase in one of those houses? You bump into everything. Trust yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's going up to the second floor. And then we get to the fourth line, which is the resonance to the first line. And because, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's the, it's the harmonic. And uh, the fourth line is the foundation or the fixed line of the upper trigram. So the fourth line, no longer is it about getting a solid foundation or about being a genius and expressing, um, you know, that natural talent. And no longer is it about testing it out. The fourth line assumes that it works and assumes that it's valid. And if you find fourth lines who are on some sort of mission or they have a company or they have a belief or religion or they have something they're trying to do, they don't question whether it's valid. There's no questioning for the fourth line. The third line questions, how does this work or not? You know. The fourth line just assumes it works, and their question is, how do I successfully 
convey this to others? How do I successfully externalize this to others? How do I successfully get this across to others? So what, what fourth lines do we have here? Four, six, and then one, four. And they do it in a very fixed way. Right, the first and the fourth lines are the fixed. It's like which, they externalize the first line investigations. Well, they externalize the whole bottom three. They externalize the first line authority, the second line genius. I mean, there could be a second line who has a company and there's a fourth line working for them. And they're, this is the biggest genius you've ever met in your life. There's no other genius as big as this genius. They're not questioning whether that person's a genius. They're just accepting it. There could be a third line who has done a lot of trial and error in the business sense or in scientific or anything, and they've discovered a bunch of scientific discoveries. The fourth line is not going to question whether that third line is valid or not. Mm -hmm. They're not here to ask, how do I make sure what I'm putting out there is true? They're here to make, to ask, how do I convince others it's true? Know how to influence, basically. Yes, how do I influence others? How do and I get... Influence to... others that they know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, exactly. Because if yeah. you think about, if the first line is getting its solid foundation and its own authority and its own abilities, the fourth line's equivalent, because it's upper trigram, so it's dealing with other people, it's kind of getting outside of the person and, and accessing others, its foundation is its network. And so the fourth line is really here to build a network that it provides opportunities to, provides opportunities between people in that network, and takes opportunities from. Spheres of influence. Exactly, exactly. So the fourth line being the sort of foundation of the upper trigram process is really the, the social cohesion or the social glue. And they invest very heavily in their friends. They, you know, it's very much about Building, um, bu building, building a, a community. Network. Yeah, a network, exactly. And they're opportunity-based. Yeah, and so the fourth line comes to represent the status quo because they're not really questioning what they're externalizing. They're simply putting out there what they have developed as, you know, they're bringing things to others. So it's like they can be incredibly influential and create a lot of trends. Like somebody's into Taibo, or something that the Taibo guy's got to have been a fourth line. Maybe he was a third line, but he had a fourth line marketing team. Or even just in a friend network, somebody starts doing Taibo, or somebody starts doing fourth any of these. Fourth line nodes or something. Yeah, but I mean, I'm just saying, you know, anybody who has fourth lines in their network, what they'll find is the fourth line gets tired of doing yoga and they start doing kickboxing, and pretty soon everyone's doing kickboxing. Now, the fourth line isn't questioning whether kickboxing or yoga or anything they're doing is better or worse or really works or not, they're just assuming it is because what they're really here to do is sell others on, it's, it's how do we convey the message? How do we get the message across? So if a fourth line's in business, they're not here to make sure they have a good product, they're here to make sure people think it's a good product. And what it ends up doing is enforcing a status quo. And the status quo will change over time, that's where we get the theme of the fourth line of abdication. If enough people say, no, it's bad, the fourth line will change. But that's a last resort. Because they're very fixed. They're not here to change. They're here to maintain sort of a fixed externalization. And it's a very slow process. Uh, the fourth line, just like the first line may take 10 or 20 years to really become an expert, the fourth line can take 10 or 20 years to really build a community. So if the fourth line continues to move or change networks or move as a stranger to a new city and so on, it's the equivalent of a first line starting an entirely new field where they were a glass blower and now they have to learn to be a cellist or something. You know what I mean? It's the equivalent of just starting over at square one. It's not transferable skills, you know. It really is starting over at the very beginning and that's how the fixed works. And they got that other one we were talking about earlier about needing uh, a thing before you leave a thing. Right. I mean, they, they always say, oh, yeah, if you want to... Don't leave a lover till you have another lover. Don't leave a job till you have another job. All of these kinds of, you know, it makes it easier for the transition for. Well, and the fourth you know, line, the fourth line gains an influence and gains in power, and yeah. they really it is that kind of trading up thing where they start with a dollar and end up with a house, because whatever they have, they are then able to use to increase their influence to gain the next step, in that. But when they leave something and they don't have it anymore, they don't have anything to trade or they don't have any opportunity uh, to present to others. Um, and it's really interesting. If you know fourth lines, you know, if you have a swimming pool, all of their friends will come to the swimming pool. 
if you don't have a swimming pool, you know, a fourth line, you probably have access to a swimming pool. It's, it's that kind of thing. It's like they are the ones who, very Robin Hood kind of theme. Uh, now we get to the fifth line, and the fifth line is said to be, is the harmonic of the second line. So it's the second story. And just like how the second line kind of has, they're, they're dancing naked with the lights on, and they don't know if somebody can see them. Well, the fifth line has the curtains shut, or the blinds closed, and they're peering from behind the curtain. This is very Wizard of Oz. And everyone's making up stories about the fifth line, because they never see them. The fifth line can see out, but nobody can see in. They're looking out from that second story, and they can see pretty far into other people's lives. Nobody really knows what the fifth line's life is like. And in fact, this is the second projection field that we have, the first being the second line. The second line projection field is always a projection that starts negative. You should do this, but you probably won't. And then people are surprised if they actually do. So any second line, they're always telling them, you should join Facebook, you should do this, you should get on this. You you'd should be great at start, it. Yeah, you'd be so fun at that. You should start making these videos. You should start, you should make t-shirts. You know, you should do this thing. And then they're shocked if they actually do it. Because the assumption is just, well, they're being told they should do things all the time. It's a negative projection. Well, yeah, they, they could do so much more. The second line is kind of the diamond in the rough. You know, you should get into acting. You're amazing. You'd be a great actor. Then you see them in a Hollywood movie. You're like, they actually did it? It's amazing. I didn't think, it, I didn't think they would. You know, it's like the, the assumption is that the second line just won't, won't do what, they're, what people see in them. So it's a negative projection. It's always that they could be doing so much more, that they could be so much more successful or more this or more that. And then if they actually do it, you're surprised. Based on the not-self mindset of the person projecting upon them. So. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm not saying this is healthy. I'm just saying this is how the world works. And then also the second line is waiting for like a specific call. Yeah. You know, there's only like a couple. Yeah. I mean, they might... Everyone, everyone thinks they should do something different. I mean, like Von Paul, using him as an example, he's a great artist. How many people have told him he should make prints? He doesn't need to make prints. He can just draw new ones. He doesn't like making prints. He doesn't, he's made 10,000 plus drawings. He's not going to make prints, you know. They're always telling him he should make t-shirts. They're always telling him he should make this or make that. So most of those shoulds are going to fall flat. But every now and then, you know, someone says, you should check out this new cafe. And he actually shows up there. I'm like, wow, you actually came. You know, it's, it's surprising. But he does sometimes. And so the second line projection field is a negative projection field where they effectively are kind of it's assumed that they won't that they have so much more more talent than they could actually realize in the world you know oh this person would be a great actor but they don't take acting seriously they don't really put themselves out there they're just a hermit you know they're staying in well the fifth line it goes the opposite everyone assumes the fifth line can help them it's a positive projection field so the automatic projection for the fifth line is this person has a practical solution to my problem this person can help me in some way I have a health problem, you know, the fifth line doctor, they're going to solve it. I have a car problem, the fifth line mechanic, they're going to fix it. You know, I have a plumbing problem, the fifth line plumber, they're going to figure out what's going on with this. Whatever it is, the fifth line is always projected upon as having the solution to the problem. Now, if you're a 3-5 and that's an unconscious fifth line, I can't tell you how many times I've heard 3-5s say, I didn't realize they had that expectation of me, I never agreed to that. You know, they should have told me if they expected me to do that. Well, that's because it's an unconscious expectation. Conscious fifth lines know that somebody could tell you, I don't have any expectations of you. That's, we don't believe that for a second. <laughs> the five one, you could be in a relationship with someone and they say, this is casual. I don't have any expectations. We are constantly scanning to figure out exactly what they're expecting from us at every moment so we can mitigate potential damage down the road. And it's usually damage to our reputation. Because again, people are constantly making up stories about the fifth line. The fifth line lives and dies by their reputation. If the fifth line gets a bad reputation, they're ruined. If the fifth line gets a reputation of treating people poorly or not having integrity or being a cheat or a liar or any of these things, they are shunned. They are absolutely shunned. And so it's very important for fifth lines to be aware of the expectations placed on them regardless of what the people say. Because the people who are placing those expectations won't even be aware of them half the time. They've tricked themselves into thinking they don't have that expectation of the fifth line. But they do. They do. And so the fifth line is really here. It's called the heretic. And as the fourth line is the opportunist, the fifth line is really here to heretically go against the status quo 
established by the fourth line. So the fourth line is kind of all agreeing this is the way things are, and the fifth line is saying, yeah, but I'm here to universalize a new way, what will become the status quo in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm here to be the antithesis to your thesis, and hopefully we'll bring about a synthesis which becomes the new thesis, which becomes the new status quo. And so the fifth line as a universalizer, their life mission has to do with getting something new into the collective, and it's damn hard to get something new into the collective. The fourth line doesn't need to get something new into the collective. They just need to promote something or market it or, you know. Uh, the fifth line, Ra was a 5-1 and, you know, he got human design into the collective and that was not easy. How many failed attempts at getting something like human design are there that end with the destruction of that person's reputation or that end with complete ridicule or complete disaster? So the fifth line is really here um, to kind of stand at the... Well, yeah. he's got different reputations depending on who you ask. But so. overall, he has a pretty <laughs> yeah. unimpeachable reputation. No, no allegations of sexual misconduct. No, alleg you know what I mean. Like, yeah, I mean, he's but basically. There's project, but there's positive. What you're saying, there's, there's a positive projection on placed on the fifth line automatically. Yeah. Right in the first seconds of someone meeting a fifth line, they're always projecting a positive. Of, oh, they're the person who could be a. Oh, they're good for that. They would be perfect. They, they're the savior. Yeah. Exactly. I've actually heard that word used for Absolutely. me at some point directly. Yeah. Yeah. And it was cringy. But um, because there's that expectation, like, what do you do? You know, like, uh, what does that mean? But five's also here to externalize to people they don't know versus the four here to influence with people they do know. Mm -hmm. Right. And also social media is a fourth line medium. So that's why people are expanding their people they know, expand their sphere of influence. In their network, even online, mm. even though you could do it in person, but uh, yeah, the, the fourth line, like Facebook's know, fourth line medium, like uh, if you know secrets IG, about right. people, right? But and then I mean, right? But then finding somebody's website and their reputation grows, or something like that. I mean, huh. um, yeah, it's a good example. It's like of the difference between the fourth and the fifth line is that the fourth line, everyone knows everyone's secrets, and they're all gossiping about each other because they all know. You know, they've been confided in, and one person tells a secret to one person, and pretty soon 100 people know. And they're kind of, you know, the fourth line operates through, um, it's much closer. They're closer to each other. It's like they know things about each other. And that's why. It's a network. It's a network, yeah. And yeah. if you've been in that network for many, many years, you kind of have dirt on everyone, you know. But a fifth line doesn't necessarily operate through a network, it operates with the collective, and it operates through Wikipedia. If you are a fifth line and you get a Wikipedia page made about you and about the things you're doing, then any stranger can read about you. And if you have a really positive reputation, then your, your reputation will grow through the amount of help you've been able to give to absolute strangers. Mm -hmm. So strangers learn about human design. It helps them. Ra's reputation grows. They didn't have to know about him. They didn't have to know about any personal details of his life. He's behind the curtain, mm -hmm. right? But the fifth line is really here to provide practical, practical solutions in times of crisis. And the way they can do this is by building up that trust. And a lot of fifth lines will complain of any of the fifth line profiles, two, five, three, five, five, one, five, two, that they, you know, it wasn't fair that they had that expectation placed on them. Well, it's not fair to all the other lines that they don't, you know, they don't immediately build that trust. Fifth lines gain a tremendous amount of trust, and so. The fifth line isn't here to build the trust and then break the trust and then complain that their reputation is ruined. The fifth line is here to use the fact that they're trusted to actually provide something practical to other people. And if they can do that, their reputation will grow. And if not, their reputation will be destroyed. Yeah, it has to be practical. It has to be practical. It has and then to you be know when to say when. Yeah, it has to be. I mean, if Ra presented human design without anything you could actually do, without any attempts at strategy and authority, or here's something you can practice, or try this, or do that, or you know, without any advice, without any technique, without any, if it didn't work, he would have been the laughing stock. Yeah, know? it's and all it, the proof is in the pudding, exactly. and the results. So exactly. the the actual chart that you use, the design, is a practical way of mm -hmm. analyzing an individual. So yeah, yeah. Th that's something that someone can do. It's yeah, to present it in a way that can be easily understood mm -hmm. and so on. And so this is all the practicality of the fifth line. 
And then finally you get to the sixth line, which is the roof of the building. In the sixth line, uh, we have a 6-2, Mike, and then Ashley's 4-6. Any other? Oh, you're also a 5-1. Sorry, I just forgot to mention. Danny's like hiding out in the back. Like, I'm like, what are the fifth lines? He's like, he doesn't say a word. Just, you know. Well, you actually didn't say who were the fifth Okay, lines. I did. I missed that one. But, but I was using, I was using you as a 5-1. But Danny's also a 5-1. Um, and, you know, the 5-1s are kind of waiting. They, they know not to expose themselves to slights or to, you know, it's kind of like, wait on the wings of history to be past the scepter at the right moment to then make your contribution to the world. Well, <laughs> five, you mentioned one important word about fifth line. Mm. Paranoia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They can be very paranoid. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. all the projections people put on them, they don't know what people are expecting of them, whether they think they're the savior or not. Mm. Well, he's also a projector, too, so it's going to be overlaid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Layers and layers of context. Hopefully. That's why it's a holistic design, not just you're this or that. You're your whole thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So then the sixth line, uh, well, we're, we're down, we're now short of sixth line. So you're the last one. Mm -hmm. So our, our four six just left. But we have the six two. And the sixth line is really here to be the fool on the hill who sees everything from the roof. And unlike the fifth line that can see into other people's lives and then can essentially help them in some way or strives to help when they are able to, strives to step in when there's a crisis. See, the fifth line's not there to be there day in, day out. They're there to really hmm. make an impact when there's a crisis and then go back. Familiarity breeds contempt for the fifth line. Mm -hmm. And they really are meant to kind of... It's true, it's true. They're yeah. meant to kind of jump in when they're needed, save the day, build their reputation. And get out. Because, and then get out. So it's kind of, it's like the generals of times of yore where they wouldn't just be operating the army all the time. They would be like basically retired, but they would have such legendary oh. stories about them of all their military um, feats and so on that when there was a big army you know, gathering for a war, they would be begged to come out of retirement to save the day. They would. They would save the day and go back to retirement. So it's really stepping in, um, having a big impact when they're needed, you know, and so on. I guess impact is more of a manifest or keynote. But for the generator, building what is needed, or for the projector, guiding at a crucial time when guidance was needed, or for the reflector, having a sort of crucial feedback mechanism by sampling and being able to report back very useful information that practically helps people. And in any case, they're really meant to kind of step in and they're really tested in these very key moments in their life as opposed to the ongoing. So a fifth line on the job, nobody's gonna remember the 10 years that it wasn't the crisis. They're gonna remember the two weeks that there was a crisis and that the one person knew how to handle that two weeks so well and knew exactly what to do in that crisis and knew exactly how to fix everything and exactly what needed to happen. And so or not. Yeah, or they're going to they're gonna live yeah. in shame of their you know, reputation yeah. having been destroyed because a crisis occurred and they crumbled and fell apart. Hmm. So the fifth line is really there to handle the crisis. Now the sixth line um, is a very interesting one because all of us have a three-part life process, but for the sixth line, this actually... I mean, not all. I mean, the six line is the only profile that actually sort of changes its quality through this three-part life process. And for everyone who's not a six line, you can still look at these phases of your life because they are. And we we call it life cycle analysis in human design. But for the sixth line, up to their Saturn return, they're actually in a third line phase. So the sixth line doesn't actually become a sixth line really until they're in their thirties, and it takes seven years from the exact of the Saturn conjunct for them to fully get on what we call the roof, which, which again in this roof metaphor is the top. So through their teens and twenties as a kid, they're third lines. They're effectively third lines. Now if you're a three five like Mark, you're a third line your whole life. But if you're a six two like Mike, you've gone through this third line process and then you've actually gone on the roof as we call it. And you, you now have a new vantage point where before you had the trial and error process of making mistakes and doing all this. And then you go Very on. pessimistic. Uh, yeah, exactly. Happens. I mean, they, they say that the, the, the sixth line falls into pessimism by the end of their 20s, by the Saturn return. 
So they start very optimistic, believing in true love, believing in the, the soulmates and all these things. And by the end of their 20s, it's all a sham. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. They kind of just, you know, maybe that's a little bit of a difference from the third line, which is supposed to be fundamentally pessimistic. The sixth line descends into pessimism. But then they start to climb their way out of that pit of pessimism back towards optimism, which they reach by their Chiron return around age 50. And that's when they come down off the roof. So the sixth line essentially has these three phases where they're trial and error, experimentation, then they go on the roof, which is their safe place. You know, don't bring problems to the sixth line on the roof. Don't bring money issues. Don't bring relationship issues. Don't bring... They're really here to just observe. You can tell them all about them, because they're about what you're going through, because they're here to collect all of that information. They're here to see who has a good relationship or not, who's good at managing money or not. Who's, they're here to watch everybody else make mistakes. They're like, I already made all those mistakes in my 20s. I don't have any skin in the game anymore. I'm just, uh, I'm just outside. It's like a stock trader who just decides to stop trading, but they still like to watch all the financial ups and downs. And this person made a fortune, and that person lost a fortune. And, well, I don't have any money in it. I'm just watching. I'm just on the sidelines. you know. And so the sixth line... They, I won't say it's a reputation, but they become known for their objectivity and for their sort of impartial, uh, you know, in their 30s and, and, and beyond, impartial way of being. And then in their 50s, what we call the flowering phase, when they come down off the roof, they can become known really and step into this role model of really living as themselves, which is going beyond optimism or pessimism going beyond these binaries, even going beyond the subjectivity of their third line phase and the objectivity of their roof phase, to something that is beyond subjective and objective. The way I like to say it is that if the first and the fourth lines are the fixed lines, and the second and the fifth are the cardinal lines, uh, the, the third and the sixth are mutable, but they're mutable in different ways. The third line is all about adaptation. Try this, it doesn't work. Try something else. Try this, it doesn't work. Try something else. Well, the sixth line, when they're in their flowering phase, which is really when they are kind of stepping into their fullness. I mean, the sixth line is the latest bloomers of late bloomers. I mean, they really are here to bloom in their 50s and flourish in their 50s and beyond. Well, what their mutability or flexibility is, is knowing when to be heavy-handed, when to have a light touch knowing when to be pessimistic, when to be optimistic, when to be cold hard facts, and when to be em empathetic. They know, they, they, their flexibility is not that they themselves are adapting or changing, but that they've become wide enough to contain multitudes, so to speak, so that they can know, I mean, the sixth line at their best will know who's really worried and needs to stop worrying, and who's not worried and should be worried. You know, and they, that's their mutability, is what they know how to mm. adjust. And that's something I've said about other people as well, about projectors and so on. But the sixth line, you really see it because they have this, they're beyond the binary. You know, even before that, they're still trusted as the sort of fool on the hill, the impartial. And I say fool, but it's the wise fool. It's the fool who, who is kind of outside of it all, but sees everything and they don't have any skin in the game so they can be way more impartial. It's not like a fifth line who's really trying to get you to bet on them as a fifth line, trying to get you to bet on their solution because they're so convinced that their solution is the right practical solution and they're betting their entire reputation on it being the right solution. And the fifth line will be destroyed if they bet wrong. Well, the sixth line doesn't put their reputation on the line. They don't have their, they're not biased in that way. They're really just here to tell you what they see and to tell you, and of course there's going to be nuances, you know, Mike has desire, so that's here to have an agenda, but still it's an agenda of maintaining integrity. It's an agenda of, you know, um, basically remaining trustworthy and so on. The agenda of not being involved. <laughs> <laughs> Although it can get a little bit complex because of course desire is here to to sort of jump in when it's needed. And Mike has definitely helped me when I've needed him. So, mm. so that pretty much covers the six lines. I'd like to open up to the Q&A comments. Well, the, the, the other thing I would just add to put it over in a larger context of framework. Um, when you talk about, and very well done, thank you. Thank you. Um, the context of these six lines uh, and how they're expressed or how they're um, experienced 
by the self or by others experience it will depend upon whether you're self or not self. So the more you resonate with the quality of a line in its truest form, the more you're being self. It's kind of like a, you kind of, because we didn't talk about profile being a costume yet, right? We didn't do that. No, we didn't but anyway, so when you're wearing this costume of a profile, which he will get into, hopefully, um, uh, it looks very different uh, when you're self versus not self. Yeah, I guess, the qualities, yeah. the frequencies that you experience, or you experience of others, or you they experience of yours, is very different. So, like I said, the third line being the martyr. Now there's the not-self martyr, and then there's the true martyr who will stand up for itself, and not the not-self martyr that feels like it's a victim to life. Mm -hmm. Why is this always happening to me? So they're both third line qualities in a sense, but the more you're living as self, the more you're going to see, I'm going to stand up for my right, what's true, and you're not feeling like a victim. Mm -hmm. You know, the same thing with all these other qualities. So profile can give you, in these lines, can give you an indication of how aligned you are to your truth. Very well said. And what you mentioned about the costumes is kind of, um, Ra calls them costumes of purpose. And he likens it to um, many actors can play Hamlet, but when you see an actor who really nails the part and makes it their own and embodies that character in such a way that you might have never imagined Hamlet like that before, but now it's become an iconic representation of Hamlet because it's so differentiated. A big part of um, human design is this idea of differentiation where these profiles are just generics. I mean, there's going to be millions of people that are five ones. I mean, really a lot. It's 13% of the people out there. So you have 500, 600 million people are five ones. You know, some of the profiles are more rare, like the one four. You're still going to have 50 million, 60 million. I mean, you're still going to have even these rare profiles that are only one or two percent. It's one or two percent of uh, eight billion people. Yeah. I mean, that's it's actually more like hmm. eight, eight million or 16 million or however we look at it. So, um, or 80 rather. But in any case, even a small number percentage wise, there's still a lot of people out there. So they're still generics. And to really make it your own is to really realize um, you can't do it mentally, but you can kind of observe it happening when you're following mm -hmm. strategy and authority. You can go, wow, I can see how I am just stepping into this role. I am stepping into the, I'm stepping onto the stage. I'm, I'm fulfilling this role that I didn't really realize I had in me. And wow, I guess I really am this, you know, I am here to have a purpose. And it really is reassuring because it's kind of one of those, it's almost like those memes where it's like progressively mind blown to, to greater and greater levels of enlightenment, where when you get into human design, you have to really give up a sense of purpose and almost go through a nihilistic dark night of the soul because the purpose that you knew was the not self purpose that was built up around, mm -hmm. well, I have an undefined ego. I must be here to prove myself to people. Well, I have an undefined spleen. I must be able to, here to prove how good I am at not letting go. I have an undefined solar plexus. I must be here to prove and not let go to how good I am at tiptoeing and, and avoiding confrontation. You know, mm -hmm. And we have all of these purposes that we spend an entire life building up that are not the true purpose. So we have to let go of it only to have the relief that comes after years and years of experimentation of then being able to witness that we've stepped into a purpose without realizing it. That is our higher purpose and is our true purpose. So people will always ask me, where is my purpose? And you know, what is my purpose in the chart? And of course you can look at the incarnation cross to get clues, but the real answer is we don't know until you've lived it. Yeah. Because the descriptions we have of the profiles and the incarnation crosses and all of it are generics. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you've experimented with it enough that you can see how you're living out your truth and your purpose in a way that even you could not have predicted. Yeah, it's some, it's yeah to piggyback on that, which is great, is is that um, there is the mechanical generics that get you to a certain place, but how is expressed uniquely as that individual based on all of the things in a chart, all your things in your design, all the layers coming together gets expressed through that you know through you know through all these purpose through the it, the purpose comes out. Mm -hmm. 
right? But we don't know exactly what that is, like you said. But we know what it can, the framework of how that purpose is going to look or how it's going to unfold or how it's going to maybe be felt by others or how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. But the specific, whatever that purpose is, no. Yeah, we can see that a fifth line is either going to be able to provide practical solutions and their reputation will grow, or they won't no. and they'll yeah. be destroyed. A third line is either yeah going to stand up for something or they're going to be self-victimizing and sort of externalizing their pessimism. The pessimism can be perfectly healthy for the third line mm -hmm. when it's the pessimism of someone telling them, this is going to work right the first time. And mm -hmm. they're like... No, it's not. But it can be really unhealthy if that pessimism becomes a not-self mm -hmm. story about how everybody else has it easy and they have it hard. Yes, so, mm -hmm. exactly. So. Okay. All right, let's open to open up to some questions. Let's do that. I don't know if I can articulate this effectively, but I've been holding this question of the third line feels a lot like individual circuitry, of like I also liken the third line to like Goldilocks like needs to test the porridge or needs to test the bed for the truest bed, but it's a very individualistic perspective. And so I guess I'm curious, does that resonate with anybody from that third line perspective, that connection with individuality? Well, if you know people close to me, I go, I, I, I like everything. I'm like Goldilocks, man. I like it just right, whatever that is. I say that all the time. It's funny. As a 3-5. And, and uh yeah, it is, it is about trying things to find what's correct. And it can be individual in nature. Um, uh, certainly, you know, uh, a lot of the, it's mutative, right? You, as Jonah yeah. expressed that way, and so is an individual circuitry. It's very potentially mutative. Um, it can empower people, you know. So can discovery of something that doesn't work or what inevitably does work you know oh don't do that it can be empowering oh that works you might want to try that you know and it, that could be empowering so i i agree yeah, that has some similarities to it where you can connect that yeah yeah and i have a comment unless do you have something to add to um, I love, yeah that sums it up yeah the mutation thing Technically, the mutation happens between the third and fourth line, so there's mm -hmm. a little bit of a connection also between the individual and the fourth line, weirdly enough, even though they're so social. Yeah, you wouldn't think of the fourth line as individual, but I, I, so there's a few ways of approaching it. At one point, Ra did categorize the first and second lines as fundamentally akin or with continuity to the tribal, third and fourth to the individual, and fifth and sixth to the collective. Mm -hmm. That's already interesting because you would say, doesn't it all start with the individual? But it's kind of like... Maslow's hierarchy of needs where yeah. if you don't have the ability to differentiate if you don't have your fundamental needs met it starts with the tribe mm -hmm. human society started with the survival of tribes of people in caves, in caves. if you're not yes. having warm shelter from the elements and safety from saber-toothed tigers and food and water you can't differentiate as an individual you don't have the luxury of being melancholy because you're running from a saber-toothed tiger so it is funny to see <laughs> yeah. how that works. So yeah. at one level, yeah. We also see that in the mystic way, how it moves from tribal to individual at the 40th gate, which is the gate of aloneness, but it's a tribal gate. So it's like aloneness as a socially determined function, not an actual cosmic melancholic individual aloneness. That's a good point. Yeah, it's like the ability to be alone with the tribe is the bargain that says, I've worked for you, now leave me alone so I can go be individual. Mm, yeah. I have given back yeah, to the that, tribe. That's the great trophy at the end of well, it's, it, the it's, something, it's on the ego. So, yeah, you go, <laughs> and it's something yeah. Carl Jung said, which is that he believed the reason that there was so, much, so many problems, psychological problems and so on with artists was because they had forsaken the sort of easy way out, the sort of tribal way, not in his words, but in human design, of giving back and being socially supportive. And mm -hmm. so instead they went off to make art where there's, it's a gamble of whether they can create something that can give back to society. Mm -hmm. And if they fail at that, then they experience all of the guilt of having only taken and not giving mm -hmm. anything back through actual manual labor and other kind of more tangible forms of support. And so they have a lot of neuroses that develop from the sort of intense pressure to give back to, to society, to mm. try. But the other thing I'll say is, um, while, while there is some continuity between the 
the lines and you know the first two being tribal, uh, the second two being individual, mm-hmm. and the last two being collective. There's also continuity that we could we have studied in previous human design catalysts, and we could do again, although it is a fairly advanced topic. But that is the streams, mm-hmm. and there's continuity at some level between the six lines and um, really the six streams, which we also we usually look at in terms of tone. And that's another interesting one where the first is tribal and the sixth is tribal. And then we have Mm -hmm. logic and collective. And then I guess collective and logic, or we also have logic and collective in the middle. Mm -hmm. So there's no individual in that um, particular analysis. But, and I guess my last comment would just be um, the individual, you can learn a lot by studying the body graph and studying the circuitry of the body graph and noticing that Individual circuitry goes to all nine centers. Collective circuitry makes it to eight. Tribal only makes it to six. There's no collective circuitry in the, um, sorry, there's no tribal circuitry rather in the G center, the head or the Ajna. So it's just some kind of interesting, interesting bits you can learn there by studying it. But yeah, there's definitely a connection. It's probably easier to see the connection of the third line to individual than the fourth line, because you might think, well, the fourth line is so social, how could that be individual? But remember that it's also about a fixed externalization that's not questioning. And so maybe that's part of the continuity there as well. Yeah. And it's kind of about getting the mutation out, getting something out that's been vetted and let's mm-hmm. put this out into the world. So, good question. Yeah, interesting one. Yeah. Um, when you were concluding talking about the fourth line, you said something like it's like a Robin Hood mentality, and I didn't totally get it, but it made my head go, does, does that relate to resourcefulness? Well, you know, Robin Hood was known for taking from the rich and giving to the poor. So if you're a fourth line and your friend has a swimming pool, then the ones that don't have a swimming pool now have access to it. Mm-hmm. You're not necessarily going to be giving money to your friend with a swimming pool or bringing them a lot of opportunities. You're going to be taking the resources they have and sharing those resources with people who don't have them. So uh, it can be very one-sided. I mean, the fourth, the fourth line can be very magnanimous with the have-nots, but it can be an entirely one-sided taking from the haves. Mm. Like, this person doesn't really need this. You know, I have access mm. to these resources. They have a big collection of books. I just steal their books. I don't really care. I give the books to people who can't afford them. It's a very, like, one-sided, well, that's the Robin Hood, you know? It's not really, like, it's not about, like, I have to make sure that I give equally to everyone in my network. It's like, no, I have people in my network that have too much, people that have too little. I'm just going to take from the ones that have too much. I'll know them for 10 years. I'll never give back to them. I mean, because they already have enough. They don't need it. So it's, it's a very one-sided thing in that way. And they, they have their meanness, niceness switch. And so it's like you could be in their in-group one season even and then not the next season. So you might get invited to the pool in the winter and not in the summer, which would be kind yeah. of Yeah, the fourth line is, is known for its kindness and its sort of magnanimity and kind of being kind by default. But then if something happens that makes them switch to the meanness, it can be really exclusionary. And Ra joked that the, the meanness... The easiest way to make a fourth line mean is to have sex with them. And the moment that it becomes that there's sexual interaction, the meanness begins and they can't control it. And before, you could have known this person for years and they were nothing but nice to you. The moment you have sex with them, even if it's the most blissful, wonderful experience of loving, care, and consummation, the meanness sets in. And the next day they start, and the next day they're a little meaner, and the next day they're a little meaner. And you have to work your way through that meanness. And it happens again and again and again. It can be really a trip for people. Like, I, I know someone who was um, dating a fourth line who was so nice to all his friends and everyone, and, and you know, but then they, it kind of didn't work out and they broke up, and then she was mean to him. Now, it wears off. She gave him an opportunity to then once again be nice to her after it cooled off. He was mean to her again, so then she doubled down on the meanness. But it became this thing where, and I've been the recipient of this as well, where you're hanging out with your fourth line friend or f- former partner or anything, where you've done something to them, and it doesn't have to be sex. Obviously, it can be just a fight or a disagreement or anything that gets them to switch, really. Or it can also be, because fourth lines can all be influenced by each other, that you didn't even have sex with this person, you just had sex with someone in their network, and you broke that person's heart. And so they all have turned mean as a sort of way. And I'm not, I mean, but the thing is, like, with enough time, you're. If you're on the receiving end of this, all I can say is 
don't complain about it because you will be given the opportunity to be nice again. And if all you do is complain and go, that wasn't fair, why are these people being mean to me? It's gonna make it worse because you're not understanding what you did. The fourth line is not gonna be mean to you for no reason. They're gonna be mean to you because you did something wrong to them. You betrayed them. Well, they perceived them. it as wrong. Yeah, but generally speaking, it, it is. I mean, if you had known how to navigate that situation better, they probably wouldn't. At the same time, there is a sort of inevitable meanness that will set in which is simply the resentment of having invested in someone or given to someone and not gotten a return. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, it's very common to hear people complain about the fourth line and say, what did I do to them? You know, and it's like, it might not have been obvious what you did to them, but at the same time, there was something that switched it. And so a lot of people will kind of make excuses that I never did anything wrong. Why am I receiving the meanness treatment from the fourth line? Fourth lines are never mean for no reason. Fourth lines are nice to everyone off the bat. And I've had fourth lines I've known for 10 years that are still nice to me. I've had fourth lines that have never been mean to me ever. Granted, we haven't been physically intimate. That is one of the most difficult things to navigate with a fourth line and something Ra talks about quite a bit which is the fourth line's relationship to intimacy, which is kind of unusual because the fourth line has such a theme of brotherhood and sisterhood that it is really here for friendship first, and you have to really make sure there's a solid friendship that can handle and withstand and sort of cushion any sort of intimate or romantic connection. Because if it can't, the fourth line will switch over to the mean well, side. it's about trust, too, because, it's like you're right, either they're the confidant or not. So mm -hmm. you have to earn that trust with the fourth line that they can say, oh, all right, I can accept this person um, and be in my life, be influential back and forth, because I trust them. You have to continue to courageously <clears throat> talk to them as you would talk to a friend. One story I have is there was a 4'6 friend of mine who was saying, Hey, we have a mutual friend, he was a 3-5, and uh, we were dating, and then we broke up, but I feel kind of weird about it, and I just want to know, is this how he talks to his friends? And she told me what he said, and it was extremely flowery and obtuse, and it was full of all of these really weird mannerisms that he would never say to his friends. It was like, hmm. I just think at this stage in our development of psychological truth that we must honor our celibacy into a new phase of... No, he would say, <laughs> I stopped dating this woman. I got tired of it. I'm sick of this. If somebody actually says that to a fourth line, they like it so much better because mm -hmm. they're, they're not being bullshitted mm -hmm. with all of this flowery. It's like, talk to the fourth line as a real friend. You'll stay on the kindness side. Yeah. But the moment that you're trying to manipulate them, the moment you're trying to hide from them, the moment you're pretending yeah. and you're not yeah. really confiding in them and you're not really being their friend, you will get the meanness. And mm -hmm. then people love to go around complaining about all the meanness from the fourth lines. It doesn't happen for no reason, folks. You know, It happens because of the But then again, there's up. no one to blame. Right. I mean, there's no one it's to blame. It's just mechanics. But you can learn. Yeah, there's no one to blame, but you can learn to notice it and to, and to kind of take your own responsibility for your part in it, rather than, I mean, even just saying I didn't do anything wrong is doing something wrong in some sense. I don't mean in a moral way. I just mean if you really want to repair and you're on the meanness side of the fourth line, stop shirking responsibility and making it that they did something wrong by being mean to you. Well, yeah. Well, and, and I think a lot of... <laughs> yeah. well, See what I'm saying? But if I'm taking response as of having a four line... On my part, let's say I don't have any control over that other person. Yeah. Do I just notice that I'm feeling annoyed and then I, I need to be like, hey, we need to have a sit down or something? Like, how do I... I mean, it's not... If, if they well, ask what, you... What is your like, type? A generator. And your profile? One four. One four. Generator. Are you emotional? I don't remember. Do All I right. But I mean, there's layers of these I things. I am emotional, yeah. You're here to respond to something, right? So yeah. you're responding to this person... Who's giving you some kind of this recent person is resistance? Alive, by the way, all right. Well, they're all, they're not all saints. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, for all those people who know me out there, um, uh, but you know, depending on your overall design and how you would deal with it, you're responding to something, and if in response to something outside you you feel moved to do something about it, fine. 
It's from your gut. It's not from your mind. All right. Right. And I think it all happened naturally because I've, I've seen people complain about the fourth lines. I never had a chance to make it right. They give you chances. Fourth lines do. All right. It might take them six months. It might take them a year. But you will have that chance. And if you're still all bent out of shape about it and going, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Why are you mean to me? Blah, blah, blah. That was your chance and you yeah. just blew it. So mm -hmm. and that's this, all I have this to say the, about This that. is the yeah. part where I put the disclaimer in every show that says, you know, it's different if you're self versus not self. A lot of these situations that you have experienced probably in your history and everyone has, a lot of it is because people are predominantly not self, living as not self, and they're creating a lot of not self stuff, but the characteristics and traits of one's design, like being a fourth line with kindness, meanness as a, a, as a, a, a potential, is going to be expressed one way or the other based on whether it was correct or incorrect. Really, so yeah, it can the be more to be mean, it can be yeah, yeah, it can yeah be but it could be nice. it could be corrected, but yeah. but anyway, the, a lot of these things that uh, many of us experience and we associate with um, all these things we experience. Again, when you become more self, like these numbers resonate at a different frequency when you're not self. So it's like it, you're adjusting your radio dial, your personal dial. And it's going to have a frequency that people who are here to tune into you will be able to. But when you're out of tune or they're out of tune, there's a lot of noise, you know, a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get a lot of experiences that are more aligned to not self outcomes or experiential themes of what it means to be not self. So always put that in the context for people because... We can't forget that we, the world, and it's no one's fault out there. Anyone listen to this? The world, we're inundated with conditioning from birth and before birth. And, and we have all this going on. And it's very hard, you know, as conditioned adults who are deconditioning to get to a place where we're going to be mostly self. It takes time. That's why there's a seven-year process at minimum. I think that's the beginning once you get done seven years then you really begin uh, at least that's my experience um 17 plus years in um uh, you have to really consider that overall context when you're dealing with people because you may have a design of a projector a generator you may be this profile that profile this incarnation cross that incarnation cross none of that really matters if you're operating incorrectly because you will not live out your purpose. You will not live out the costume of your profile. You will not live out according to your type. You will not be following your authority. You'll be following your mind's uh, conditioning of uh, how it interacts with whatever is open in your body, in your design. And that's where all those things are going to come from. So that's the caveat I always say when you're looking at all these things. Remember where you are when you're talking about these things. Are we talking about people predominantly not self with the design potential of their design, or are they actually living their design correctly, and then it's being expressed with that frequency that's truer than the not self frequency, which is a distortion, static. And because you're dealing with static, they're dealing with you that might be static, so that's just more static. So how does it resonate and flow? And, and that's by being self and operating correctly. So understanding that you're a generator that needs to re-respond to something outside yourself, you know, you see, oh, he's acting a certain way. You respond to it. And then you could say, hey, can we do that? You know, if you feel in the moment, your gut, as long as you're not emotional and you're just a pure sacral gut, then you're like, in that moment, you know what you need to do. You respond in the moment, right? Now, if you happen to be emotional, that you might, it's a feeling out process if you feel like it's when it's correct to address it or not. It probably won't be in that moment if you're emotional. How do I know if I'm emotional? She is. You are. <laughs> okay, I am. So, 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 so you, 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 you're the person, you're the person who writes that angry email that should never send it. Uh, on it. Yeah. Yes. And actually, <laughs> especially not send it in its first draft. <laughs> you know, or it's second, or it's third, if ever at all. 
It might even be better just letting it go, you know, because we can't also control how other people are perceiving it. If you're seeing from yourself in the correct way how you feel to do, it doesn't mean they're going to receive it that way. But if it's correct for you to share it that way, then you don't, you know, you do what you have to do for you. I got something to add. Yeah. Every, every profile has a different way of weeding people out automatically. And especially if it's unconscious, you really don't have to think about doing it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and the fourth line equivalent of that would be the just like whatever, when that switch is turned and all of a sudden you're meaner and nicer to a person than you used to be. Like if that person's right for like when I think about the fourth lines in my life, the ones that I get and they get me and we're right for each other or whatever, when they are mean to me, I like, I almost like it. Like, it's like, good. It's fine. You know, it's like, that's like, that's, that's interesting. That's kind of funny. You know, it's like, it works in a weird way. I don't get mad at them. And the fifth lines in my life who I love when my expectations of them are thwarted because I'm filling them up with all these, whatever fantasies or ideals or whatever. Um, I just adjust my expectations for them. I'm not crestfallen. And so the fifth line's way of like weeding people out, people that are inappropriate for them, are like, who gets crestfallen when you disappoint them? Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'll add one for the third line. Uh, the third line needs to make and break bonds. Mm. And so that they don't need to say, I'll never see you again. I'll always do this. I'll, you know, it, they just need to say, I'm done for now. Mm. You know, and the amount of resistance to them coming and going is kind of a signpost of who is healthy for them or not. Uh, and where, who shames them right and who yeah shame on you for leaving when I needed you or this or that it's like do that. well it's just right but I mean true. for me I've noticed that the third lines that I, I'm correct with I'm like easy come easy go yeah. and that I'm happy when I see them and it's okay if they leave and I understand it and <laughs> it's kind of it's not like I'm making a big deal and resisting or fighting against their coming and going um, and you know one last point I would say as, as generators just to kind of add to what you were saying Ra used the example of a tennis player when he first started talking about generators, that they're really here to just hit the ball that comes to them. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the ball's going to come. And whether you're a fourth line or you're on the other end of the fourth line and you've had any damage to that relationship, the ball is going to come. Mm -hmm. And if you've, what have you been practicing in the meanwhile? You know, I used to be a piano teacher and I would always have people slow down until they could play without mistakes. Because if you play and make a mistake, you're practicing the mistake. You're just practicing making mistakes over and over again. And if all you're doing is practicing making mental decisions of undefined ego, proving how good you are at something, or, or undefined solar plexus, avoiding the confrontation, and all you're doing is really practicing all of this not-self stuff, mm -hmm. and, or you're practicing complaining about the other person, then when the, when the ball comes, you're not going to be able to hit it very well. Yeah. It's not going to go over the net. And so it's really about this sort of self... Um, practice of really living as yourself, making decisions as yourself, mm -hmm. day after day after day. It might be five years before that person crosses paths with you again. But if you've practiced and become more refined, is actually a word you use a lot, and I really like how Mark talks about the refinement process of human design, then that refinement will show, mm -hmm. and it will it will show in how clean your ability to respond to that person is, how mm -hmm. clean your emotional field is, uh, how patient you are with needing more time to get clarity and you're not rushing anything and you're not making any decisions too soon and you're just very composed and, and careful and, and all of this stuff. And it, it will show. I mean, it will because you've mm -hmm. done a lot of work, as they say. But it's not the mental work, I, oh, undefined ego, I'm going to prove to you how good I am. Undefined solar plexus, I'm going to you know, avoid all this confrontation. No, it's the work of really living as yourself so that you haven't built up resentment. You know, if you want to smoke a cigarette, smoke a cigarette. And if you have undefined ego and you're trying to prove that you can not smoke cigarettes and you have the willpower not to smoke it, and then somebody comes to you and you snap at them, I used to joke, I'm smoking for your benefit, not mine, you know, because if, if it's really correct for you to have that cigarette, if you're living as yourself, and you're accurately responding and you have clarity about it, then trying to mentally override what your body mm. wants will only make you ill-prepared to hit that ball when it comes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's about what's correct, basically. Yeah. And yeah. there's something I want to add to something you said earlier, because it's an adage that's used often that I always found a problem with. Okay. Because um, it's not true, and it piggybacks off what you're saying, sure. is that, you know, the adage, uh, practice makes perfect. 
And it doesn't because uh, like what you said, you're practicing the mistake. Mm -hmm. It's like, right, when you're doing the keyboard, you slow it down. It doesn't always make perfect. No, you perfect practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that's you 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 do it the way that builds that Mm -hmm. skill or muscle, whatever you want to call it. You do it to in the way that's aligned to the outcome. You know, you know, if you want to be uh, do the most amount of push-ups that you can ever do, the best thing to do is push-ups, not necessarily weightlifting. You know what I mean? It's like push-ups are the thing. You do push-ups, and and, and you know when you're doing various things in in your life, you practice those things. You you practice to perfect that thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. If you're practicing waiting for your for your clarity, you're really practicing patience. And there was patience. kind of kind of a you know funny riddle uh, that Ra said, which is the uh, the reward for patience is patience. It's basically saying the reward for being patient is that you are a patient person. And right. It's like it's, it's its own reward, really. There's nothing else there, but you get to have the rewards of being patient, which is being patient. Well, now, now, now just to use you as an example, as a, as a defined solar plexus emotional person, you know, you're not here to be spontaneous. You know? I'm an Aries, so I'm so spontaneous. Yeah, well, see, that's... <laughs> We're, well, we're often very much the very thing we're not. I, or, you know, we're not the very thing we are. We, I don't know. Well, our design is one thing and we do the opposite. Yeah, I mean, we, we, have, a, we have a growth and obviously it is, um, you know, there's, uh, there's two different paths of least resistance. There's the path of least resistance for the mind, which is to remain this petty tyrant that controls everything through its strategic decision making. And there's the path of least resistance for the form, which is to do what's natural for the form. And the mind has controlled the decision-making process for your entire life and everyone's entire life. Yeah. And human design is the practice of dethroning the mind and so and kind of letting the form make the decisions. And let the mind be a great way of sharing one's knowingness or insights as an outer authority, as we're doing here. We're expressing our outer authority, um, and that's what the mind is for. It, it's really for, you know, as a nine center B, it's communion. It's about really about communication and communion with the other, and how do we do that? We express it, right? And that's what the, the beauty of the mind is, because it can organize, it can, it can uh, contrast, and you can get all this information, but then it's the ability to get that information and then share it. When correct, because mm. also a lot of people have out of authority, but they don't share it correctly, and then they get a lot of resistance. Mm. Let me tell you what to do. Did I ask you? No. Mm. All right. Uh, all right. Well, let me. You know, mm. that gets that gets resistance. So as a projector, like, uh, you know, I to guide people, you you want to be recognized and invited, and it has to be a correct invitation. Just because it's an invitation doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. You know, you have to follow your, your authority. I'm splenic, so in the moment I know. But if I'm trying to weigh it, see the splenic person who's spontaneous sometimes can wait. And they're looking to, to the right timing. Or they, no, the timing is like whatever that, whatever that little spontaneous hit that you just got in your body, you hear it, whatever, how you experience it, that's your truth in the moment. And you don't look for reasons. And <laughs> the mind's always looking for reasons. How you feel over time. Is what's important, not the mental reasons. It's not what you think. Oh, this is good because this was, this guy does this and he goes here and there. No. What do you feel? What do you feel? That's what's really here in your body. Mm-hmm. Not here in terms of the actions that you're going to take. But can I still make... Like, if there's a necessity or if it's not, like, a huge deal, can I still respond with, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but, like, right away? Or that's, like, a thing that has to... Just Depends just on the context of whatever it is. You always... You have a wave, but some waves are very short and some waves are years. Well, she's also split. So she's got uh-huh. her root to her emotion and then she's got her sacral to her identity. So you uh, gotta have a hit of this is who yes. I am. But the what to do over time... Because you're split, they, those two they're not chunks, speaking to they each don't other. talk to each other yeah. quickly. So giving it time allows your resources to connect to each other. 
Is it a wide split or talking, one gate split? We're talking about like yeah. major life decisions, right? Because I mean, you can't yeah. wait on things always, right? If a like, car's gonna hit you, you're making a <laughs> What if it's like, right do you want to go hang out tonight? Like, how do I wait on that? Like, I have to choose. How right? nervous does that make you? <laughs> the question is it somebody that you've been hanging out with for 10 years? Is it something you've done every week? Is your fourth line is it a network somebody in your network or somebody not you is know? it more the real question would be if it's somebody that you've had a crush on and or that you've developed and you kind of been waiting for them to ask you and you've already gotten excited then you got really disappointed then you got excited again then you got disappointed again you've already been through both sides of that wave a number of times maybe you met them you thought there was something there then you realize no it's not going to work out and you kind of like already been disappointed you've already been excited mm -hmm. you've already been through the ringer if it's somebody that you just met at a bar and they're like come out with me tonight be like let me get back to you let me mm -hmm. see how i feel once i'm out of your aura for a little bit especially yeah. somebody you don't know okay. yeah somebody you just met because yeah. you're four you're a four yeah. so we you know that's about people you know that's your your in your sphere of influence your network they're not in your network they it doesn't mean they can't become part of your network yeah they just but you just you need to you need time. That's like that's not where you say, "All right, let's go uh, hang out." You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's that wouldn't be so. And anything that's coercing your time, that if you're like someone's trying to make you make a decision, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. So it says because they're you have your own timing. Anything anyone who's emotional has their own timing mm -hmm. to life. So if it's not the right time, it's not the right time. You have to feel it though. I'd be curious why it feels like a frustration for you to wait, um, if you care to talk about sure. it. Sure. I mean, my actually very recent relationship with this projector guy who's a 3-5, there was a lot of conflict around that, around him wanting things fast and in mm -hmm. a time. And I think just like progress, societal programming was like, you need to compromise and learn to adapt to be with people. And I just like got really off center, honestly, over time. And um, but in the day to day, why does it feel like it matters? Um, I think it might be just like capitalism and speed of culture and stuff. Like this sense of movement, um, taking action is a valuable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a three five splenic. You said is he? Or she does projector. Oh, he's a three. He's a three five it. projector. But I use air quotes because uh -huh. this goes back to my little soliloquy of mm -hmm. people being self or not self. Oh, yeah. You know, because if you're a three five, what frequency? Are, what station are you on? I think it was super you know, what, are you on the not self station? I'm getting you in there, or are you in the self frequency? And the same as a projector. So you got the three five, the projector, the you know, there's all that you're this amalgam of all this collection of of this and that. Mm -hmm. So they all get put together. But there's a certain way that that kind of weaves together and it comes out. So for you, like, you know, you're one four emotional generator, you know, with a split which is also important to know, but that's something else. Um, but, you know, you, you, you have to become that emotional one for project, uh, generator. You know, that's, you have to be it, embody it. And as a projector, he has a much harder, much harder path to be in self, usually, sometimes. Because they're just, they're so different projectors. Generators have a, usually, not always, have a, a usually a, a easier way of getting into um, living themselves more accurately. Now, usually a gut generator, pure sacral generator, who can operate in the now, they they have the easier time of anybody. Maybe if there's such a thing as easier, I put that in quotes too. Yeah, just because it's all relative. They can start experimenting with it and then have this new adventure. That doesn't boom, have boom, a constant yeah. sort of emotional, hormonal pressure of the emotional system saying act, 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 and having to learn how to be patient and learn how to trust that you're not going to miss the right opportunities. Because with the defined solar plexus, there's a real fear of missing out if they don't act, strike while mm -hmm. the iron's hot. And, well, if I keep waiting, it's going to go away. And, of course, it is true that at a certain point, you know, the fruit will rot on the vine. So there is a point where you must act. But when you've waited long enough that it's in danger of rotting, you know that you've waited a long enough time 
to really do it. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're excited, you know, oh, I just mm -hmm. met this person, I don't want to mess this up. Let's bet. Let's let's you know. Um, I mean, anything that changes your status with anyone, ex accepting a job offer, going on a trip together, any of these things, if it's going to make you nervous in the slightest, you need enough time to come to clarity where you can kind of move through the excitement and the disappointment and both sides of it. Well, yeah. I would also add, Mike, if I can invite you into this, is I love how you explain the 4130 because that's what makes her emotional. Mm. And so the baby step, I don't know if you want to talk to that. That was really helpful for me to hear. Oh, yeah, especially when you're getting to know someone, just like get to know, sample them and then reflect on it. And see how that was because like i mean there's a lot to say about that channel that we could go into but all but proceed with everything new in life whether it's a person or a hobby or a profession just like taking a bite chewing it for as long as you know whether you like it or not as long as it takes to know whether you like it or not and then have a little more and then proceed that way i also like pee pee dance I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm yeah. gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Until I'm like, I'm fucking doing it. Well, you do it a little bit each time, though. Right. Like you do put your toe in the water, yeah. and you see how that feels, and then you mm -hmm. put your foot in the water and see how that feels, and so on. Funny thing, that's a projected channel too, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, that 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 has to be recognized and invited to be, you know, to respond to. And it's a channel that wants new experience. It's mm -hmm. called Baby Steps. That's how he turned it. It should be. That. I, I, I got channel, from Jonah. Yeah, it's, oh. called, it's called the channel of recognition. It's about recogni recognizing your feelings, and you don't want to have too big of a meal of feelings to recognize all at once. So if you're dating somebody, you know, you only hold hands the first date. And if you kiss, you don't go past a light kiss. And then if you do heavy kissing, you don't go past heavy kissing. And you wait a day or a few days each time in between. And half the time, you'll realize you're not interested in that person and you'll have gone through the whole cycle of seeing how interested you are without going so far that you've kind of gotten in deeper to where there's a huge chaotic impact in your life. Um, most of the chaos in the world comes from the emotional system. And so it's a way of, I mean, obviously there's always gonna be some chaos. You can't just live like a Puritan, you know, it's not about, there's no moralism here. It's more just about getting to discover the correct chaos yeah it's, it's <laughs> discovering what you're getting into and discovering so that there's no surprises so you know exactly what it, you you're recognizing the feelings you're having and when those feelings have grown to the point where you're sure that you want to go to the next step you move to the next step but you're not rushing to the next step out of the fear it's really it's all about fear or love you know you're either loving the feelings or you're afraid that they're gonna go away, or you're afraid that they're not gonna be what you thought they were, or you're afraid you're gonna miss out on the opportunity for a better feeling, or whatever it is. And, you know. It's also the channel of fantasy too, right? Yeah, and, that, and that's, where, fantasy, and that's where the love comes in, because mm -hmm. you, you, you have your idea about what the experience is, you go out, you have the experience, and kind of what you're recognizing is that new feeling, that thing that is somehow different from whatever your preconception of it was because you might take for granted the fact that you are consistently able to imagine yourself doing something you've never done not everyone can do that you know that's a 4130 thing and so even though you've never gone fly fishing you can sort of put yourself there and then you can go out and do it and then the reconciliation of fate meeting fate meeting that experience of actually doing it out there in the world with your preconception of it is what creates that new feeling and then the love is like is do I continue to care about this enough to want to continue to indulge in my ideas about it? Now that I know what it's like to go fly fishing, where can I go with this? Like, what's my next trip going to be like? If, the, if you continue to love to speculate about the thing, even once you've sampled it, then you know you want to keep going in that direction. Well, the 41st gate uh, is also the love gate, the, the dreamer, really, the love of dreams, the dream of dreaming, right? It's also collective and it's abstract, so it's experiential. It's part of the human experiential way. It's always looking for a new experience. It's yearning, it has a desire. It's, it's, it wants that new experience. Now it's impersonal. It's just about experience for the sake of experience. So at the end of that is the 35th gate at the top of the throat, which is progress change. It's uh, the gate of insatiability, but it's the it's been there done that but by the time it 
in the beginning where you are, it's like, let's investigate. Is this something worthy, like you said, take a bite of, you know, and take more of and more of. But it's very impersonal. So uh, it's collective and personal. So even sexually, as, a, as something, um, it's more like sex for the sex experience than I'm in love with this guy. You know, or it, can, it can love the fantasy more than, yeah. yeah. It's, well, a, it's, the, it's the experience. And it's like, once you have the experience, it's like, over. All right, we're done. We got to say goodbye. All right. <laughs> you know, it's like, on to the next one. What's the next fantasy? <laughs> you just have 36, too. Oh, but penetrate. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so for you, expectations are, you know, huge. You know, so you slow yourself down is really yeah. critical. If you can. All right, let's not learn too much about this channel at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to recognize the nervousness without talking about that. I have completely undefined solar plexus. Well, you may project their fantasies onto you. Well, I'm just saying, like, you have to be honest with yourself. I think I just only need to worry about living in myself. <laughs> well, yourself is so, so nice and wonderful. <laughs> it is. For those at home, uh, there are <laughs> sorry, but should we, let's let's just let's just say hi to every everybody. Can we just uh, since let's get is there. everyone okay? Yeah, well, no, well. yeah. Here we go. Here's who's been talking off screen. We've had some off screen. We, we uh, lost some projectors. Yeah, we lost some projectors. <laughs> a few people uh, fell off, but uh, we've just had some wonderful questions from Ryan and comments from Name and. Um, any other questions for Mark, Mike, before we wrap it up? Any profile questions? Anything at all? I always have questions. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'd be curious to hear um, a conversation or comments about what it's like having the six in the unconscious versus six in the conscious. I can only account for one <laughs> of those. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you, you're right. You go on the roof either way. But it's interesting because the 4-6 never become, or the 3-6 for that matter, never becomes a transpersonal profile even after they go on the roof or whatever. Like the 4-6 remains a personal profile. They don't generate nor are they subject to transpersonal karma the way a 6-2 is. So that's, I guess that uh, the body has a different way of being on the roof. Because I guess for them, it's the body that's seeing everything, the body that's getting the realism and the perspective and whatever. Yeah, and I can. Do you have any more comments on that? No, that's good. I can comment. Yeah, yeah. So the um, yeah, the difference between the right angle and the left angle profiles. So the three six mm. and the four six are right angle profiles, and the right angle is really future oriented. Um, they are really here to kind of raw liken it to having a clean plate, where uh, you know. Seven of the profiles, the, the right angle profiles from the one, three to the four, six, are actually fundamentally future looking, where they're basically here to say, well, yeah, that might have happened in the past, but you know what? Tomorrow's a new day. You know what? We can do something new this time. And we have a clean plate, a clean slate, we're all starting over. Well, the left angle profiles, uh, there's four of them. Uh, the 5-1, the 5-2, the 6-2, the 6-3, they have a dirty plate. So anyone they've met in this life, they have some like past life karma mm -hmm. sticking to the plate still. They have some mistrust from the person who screwed them over last time. Yeah. Or they have some goodwill for some ally who helped them last time. Or they have some connection. Now, it's not to say that, that right angle people won't feel past life connections or deja vu or any of that. It's simply that even if they feel it, they go, yeah, well, that was last time. This is a new life. This is a new chance. Yeah. We're future oriented. So the left angle is fundamentally past oriented. And it's interesting that the program needs seven out of 12 profiles to be future oriented. And it needs only four out of 12 profiles to be past oriented. And then of course there's the four one, which is what we call the juxtaposition profile, which is kind of neither. They're almost, uh, we call it fixed fate. And that's kind of an interesting one. But I would just say the unconscious sixth line because they're exclusively for the, for the right angle um, it's not the same past focus or looking to, it's, it's a little bit less fatalistic even in that sense. Not to say the right angle can't be fatalistic. I know you're, you know, in the sense of uh, it's, there's no choice and so on, but just fatalistic of 
um, it, it, I, I guess what I mean is just in the sense of this is what happened last time, this is just the way the world is. You see a lot of five ones, five twos, six twos, and six threes just being like, it's just the way it is, it's just the way the world is. We're, you know, we're the administration, we've seen it yeah. all, and this is just the way it is. And then you have the right angle profile saying, just because that's the way it was doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be in the future. And the, and the right angle is more self um, mm -hmm. absorbed, and um, the left angle is more about the other. And that's a problem with the, the, the not self. Uh, yeah, you're good. You're good. <laughs> that's the, the potential issue with a not self uh, left angle uh, person is that they there's a lack of acceptance that their life is not. They're really here for the other in a sense that they're they have this dirty plate as you're, you're alluding to, and they need to clean it off. In a way, because they're here to help support and and help those that they have that karma with. Um, uh, whereas uh, the the right angle doesn't have that. They're all they're all about their their own process, their own process, their own process. So the left angle will go, um, yeah. But when is it going to be about me? Mm. You know, and that's like the not self left angle coming out when is it going to be about me well it's not going to be about you really primarily mm. it's going to be about you how you're dealing with the other mm. you know so that 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 you know because it's more you know like uh, marianne uh Winninger was talking about like you know you have karma but there is a place in time that the potential for that karma that plate to get clean and then you have no you you know you have nothing to do for that other there's no responsibility whether you know you have that responsibility and not as a left angle left angles have a responsibility to be there for that other hmm. yeah you know? I, I have a way i explain it unless you have a comment now but the, no, the way no. i explain it is just imagine you've had many many lives right angle left angle well i don't know that they're evenly distributed in fact they're probably not but say you've had seven right angle lives and then in, intermixed between them are these four left angle lives and then seven more right angle and intermixed every couple right angle lives you have a left angle life. Well what it shows is in this thought experiment the right angle lives you have a certain amount of, of karma or spiritual money that you've gained that you can spend mm. on the left angles who help you. Mm. So you kind of get to have, oh, you know, <laughs> it, like this person will help me, that person will help me. Well, I don't want this one to help me. Well, how about this one does? Or, you know, not even saying you choose it, but just your trajectory brings your you trajectory to Your trajectory brings those being, people you know, brings those yeah. people to helping mm. you. Well, now say you're a left angle. This is your opportunity to really... Um, pay off all that debt yeah. and give back mm. and so you really are here to kind of give back during that and so so in a way you're advertising your wares I mean I'm a fifth line I'm advertising let me help you the more I help you the more I pay off my karmic debt mm. and you know you can go into debt hiring me to help you karmically speaking mm -hmm. this isn't you know real money this is spirit money mm. but but the more I can help you the more I get to pay off my debt so then when I come back as a 1-3 or a 2-4 mm. or a 3-5 I then have kind of more more ability to hire other left angles to help me. So you can kind of see the world as all these left angles clamoring, selling their wares in the marketplace, saying, yeah. let me help you, and all these right angles going, who should I who should I choose? Who did I end up with? Who who can help me or not? And not that they really get to choose. I mean they it's a trajectory, but who did I who, who's been assigned to me this mm -hmm. time around? Or who am I assigned to? You know? So it's about understanding that context from both the self and not self side that yeah. you have a role. It's part of the you know part of the role of being your profile, your your costume, mm -hmm. and and how that gets played out, and and just framing it so you know that you're here to be of service to something, you know, and, and it's not just you may not get it the way you want it to unfold. No one really gets it that way either. But there's just a little extra. Sometimes I hear from left angles when they're. Um, not aligned fully that they always it's about fulfilling that karma and they don't like it totally, totally. <laughs> so it's about accepting that uh, that there is something there that you have to do and that's all that's what it is well thank I think you. that's a good place to close up thank you, thank you. Thank you. it was much rejoicing thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks everyone for joining until next time thanks so much